Hello. Yes, hello, good evening to all our invited speakers and discussants and distinguished professors. I think we're just waiting for a few more to join in. Prof. Kato and we new message. Hello, Professor Izumi. Hello, hello, Salam alaikum. Good evening. Good evening, oh. Good evening. Hello, Professor Izumi. So nice to hello. see you. such a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Abhidasha is here with us. Hello, Professor Abhidasha. Welcome. Hey, Raja. Who is today? Professor Kostadin. Welcome. Hi, Sharon. Hey, hi, Abhi. Hi, Raja. Hi, Professor Kawashima, welcome. Hi, so, Professor Kojirovada. So good to see you. Long time. Good to see you. Yeah, Chisensei, welcome. Yeah, Raja. <laughs> thank you for your invitation. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? So my my talk will be the eight o'clock. No? I presume today's uh, host. Yeah, I, I think so. So yes, Dr. Dr. Sharon is the host for today. Yes, she, it's eight o'clock. Yeah. Dr. Abida and the host. Right. The host. Okay.
Professor Carter will be joining us in one minute. Professor Kato has joined us. Hello, Professor Kato. Welcome. Good evening, Professor Kato. I'm so sorry for the day. So uh, another the webinar. So, so thank you for waiting. So uh, maybe Sharon, can you start, please? All right. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Women in Neurosurgery uh, session webinar uh, today with the uh, Japanese team, and we will be actually discussing a lot on neurovascular. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Liu Bun Seng for assisting in uh, organizing this. Uh, webinar. So today um, I will co-host the webinar with uh, Professor Abhidasha from India and uh, we will help to coordinate. Uh, we would like to first of all thank everyone for being here today including our discussants and our esteemed professors. Um, we'd like to start off with uh, Prof Kato. Would you like to give uh, any opening uh, speech for today? Thank you very much. Uh, in Japan also the, uh, we are very focused on the female uh, neurosurgeon how uh, we can continue or how we can work uh, 
So I, I think uh, uh, this is a great uh, the webinar. The today is uh, open surgery versus and endovascular. So uh, I think uh, we can have a great host, uh, sorry, great the speakers, so many speakers, and also discussant. So the, uh, we are very much looking forward to your uh, the lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you. So to start off with, we will first start off with our uh, first speaker, Professor Takashi Izumi. Professor Takashi Izumi is the Associate Professor Chief of Neuroendovascular Team of Nagoya University Hospital. Um, and he will be here today to present his topic. Hi. Are you here? Yeah, okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Shepard. My name is Takashi Izumi. And uh, uh, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kato for inviting me uh, to speak uh, here today. And I share my slide. Okay. And today's my uh, presentation is about endovascular treatment for large posterior communicating artery aneurysm with a fetal type P posterior cerebral artery. And Large posterior communicating artery aneurysm with a fetal type PCA is a refractory lesion with low efficacy of flow diverter treatment. The reason is the lack of distal collaterals and the large demand of blood flow leads to disruption in the process of re-endothelialization at the level of the aneurysm neck. How to repair large ICPC aneurysm with FPC still remains an unresolved issue. In a hospital called embolization has been mainly selected to treat these cases. Uh, so the, uh, the aim of this pre presentation is to reflect on our case series and consider the optimal treatment strategy. The analysis target is of the 27 aneurysms in 27 cases that meet the following conditions and seven aneurysms with feet of time uh, PCA. Unruptured or ruptured chronic stage aneurysm and uh, uh, between 2006 and 2023 and vascular treatment only or hybrid treatment was done. And uh, maximum diameter of aneurysm is more than 10 millimeter. Uh, in this series, definition of uh, fetal type PCA is a genesis or hyperplasia of a P1 segment. Uh, hyperplasia was defined as uh, the the diameter of P1 uh, is less than one third of a PCOM artery. Uh, this series, uh, this study was a retrospective, a retrospective analysis and the evaluation items uh, as follows. A treatment strategy, a location stent, occlusion grade at implantation and complication, recurrence, uh, occlusion grade and modified ranking scale at final follow up. Uh, the, uh, the median age of uh, these seven patients uh, is 76 years old, and the ratio of female is 71%. Uh, Preoperative uh, modified ranking scale is median zero. Uh, the only one case has a neurological deterioration due to mass effect. Here is the characteristics of aneurysm. Maximum diameter is uh, uh, median 80 millimeter. Neck length is uh, median 8.4 millimeter. The location of a peak origin is uh, uh, six is uh, aneurysm itself, and only one is uh, ICA. 
uh, five is unraptured case and the remaining two has uh, is ruptured chronic stage and uh, the prior treatment is uh, one is clipping and uh, the other one is uh, coiling two times uh, treatment strategies is uh, uh, coiling with two and the hybrid treatment is one and the remaining four is stent coil. So location of stent uh, is, uh, uh, I say only uh, here the typical fashion is only one. And the other three is from a PCOM artery to ICA, proximal ICA. And uh, including one case, one wide stent case uh, using uh, two stents. All stent is you uh, you use the uh, Elvis blue stent, a braided stent, and uh, not Elvis Jr. Initial result of treatment, uh, occlusion grade is uh, neck remnant is five and body filling is two. The complication is uh, perioperative complication is the infection is two. Uh, one is uh, uh, without neurological deterioration and the other is uh, modified ranking decrease two, two, two. And uh, in chronic stage, uh, interventricular hemorrhage and uh, hydrocephalus uh, occurred in one. Long-term prognosis is the follow-up period is uh, median time is 35 months. And there were three recurrence and uh, uh, one SH was found. Uh, one retreatment was done. Uh, occlusion grade fi at final follow-up is three is complete occlusion and one is neck remnant and three is body filling. Modified Lankin scale at final for up zero to one is uh, four, and three is one. This one uh, decree, uh, uh, this one is a uh, age rate related decrease two to three. And the uh, remaining two is five uh, due to neurological deficit. A presentative case. 77 year old female, ruptured and recurrence case after clipping. Here's the clipping, clip. And uh, uh, in this case, is uh, uh, we coiled, just coiled. But nine months later, uh, recurrence occurred. And the stent coiling was done uh, using stent only ICA. In uh, unfortunately, uh, infection uh, shower embolization was occurred, but the symptom is only nausea. But one year later, uh, recurrence uh, again, and here is three years after retreatment MRA, uh, remnant space was found. But the patient does not uh, uh, hope retreatment. Uh, but the uh, patient has no neurological deterioration. Next is 61-year-old uh, male, unruptured case, uh, 18 millimeter uh, larger aneurysm, like this. Uh, we plan the hybrid strategies and at first coiling, but patient refused surgery after coiling suddenly. So we must uh, observe the uh, aneurysm six months later, the nine, 11 months later, the remnant space uh, getting larger, and here is 18 months later. 13 months later, visual field impairment occurred, uh, and uh, uh, after all, 20 months later, uh, uh, patients agree uh, 
and bypass and isolation, but uh, uh, he does, did not uh, agree additional coiling. Uh, he is just uh, surgery, a bypass and uh, proximal shear ligation. Uh, he has a collateral pathway uh, angiogram. But 40 months later, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage occurred. Uh, final uh, modified ranking scale decreased to five. Uh, two stage treatment should be planned, taking into account the uh, account uh, the patient uh, temperament. Uh, strong, uh, this patient uh, has strong fear, and the intellectual intellectual level is not too high. Uh, so uh, uh, it's my uh, regret. And uh, next is a sixty-eight female ruptured. Uh, chronic stage uh, case, uh, two recurrence after two calling. Uh, maximum diameter is 90 millimeter uh, here. And uh, in this case, uh, stent was placed from PCOM artery to proximal ICA. Elvis blue was uh, placed and uh, enough expansion of the stent was found. And uh, here the uh, after calling without complication. And this treatment strategy is, uh, in, in my opinion, is better option. So I will show the movie here. And uh, Michael Cassita uh, deployed here. Uh, this headway uh, 17 uh, is shaped uh, like Simmons, a large J shape. And the uh, micro guide wire uh, introduced to PCOM artery, a retrograde fashion. In anti-grade fashion, it's difficult to cannulate, but the retrograde fashion is easier. Eight speeds. And uh, select the PCOM artery and pull the microcatheter, and then uh, advance the uh, guide warrior more distally to P3 segment. Uh, sorry. Uh, at that, uh, after that, the guide wire was extended uh, to uh, about 300 centimeter, retrieved the uh, headway 17, and uh, seven, headway 21 uh, was uh, uh, delivered for stenting, like this. The tip of the catheter is here. And then stent was delivered and uh, deployed. Now already deployed. Uh, please uh, notice the expansion. Here, angle is steep, but the Elvis Blue has a strong uh, radial force, and uh, uh, some manipulation maneuver uh, can expand the tent. Pull on the push technique like this. Tent was opened. And 20, 21 coils was uh, placed, including 10 hydrogel coils, like this. Here the final angiogram. Uh, AP view and lateral view. Uh, another In another angle, we can see the, the patency of the PCOM artery. Uh, Oper uh, post operative course is uneventful, and uh, here is the uh, MRA at nine months later. Uh, we can see the uh, patency of the PCOM artery with stent, and here is the bend of stent. 
And the uh, uh, small uh, remnant was seen at the neck level. Uh, this uh, cavity is uh, compatible or this uh, just after treatment. So I, I judged uh, uh, no recurrent and uh, uh, good cause. And uh, final follow-up uh, modified ranking scale is zero. And the another uh, stent case, it, 82 uh, high age male, unruptured uh, aneurysm, but the size is uh, uh, about 16 millimeter, and the uh, neck is uh, 10 millimeter. Very well male, so uh, we uh, this we I and the patient and the patient family decided to treat. And the eight friend guiding catheter was uh, placed, and the vector 71 is placed. Yeah, the vector 71. And uh, already a uh, elevated stent uh, is uh, here and uh, deployed. Uh, uh, here is the eight speeds. Actually, uh, Slow and slow, and the uh, micro catheter uh, uh, for calling was uh, deployed, and then uh, already a uh, stent was uh, fixed to PCOM, and then the remaining stent was deployed. Already stent was fixed to PCOM, so. Uh, oh, we, I can, I could uh, manipulate to pull on the push technique and deploy it. Uh, here the AP view, uh, stand, distal end of stent is here, proximal is here, distal end is here, proximal here. Uh, good uh, uh, opening of stent was found. And the uh, almost, most of the uh, uh, neck is, is was covered with stent. Uh, it's uh, with uh, covered stent. So easy to coiling uh, due to good covered with stent. First coil or second coil, third coil, fourth coil. And the uh, S coil. And uh, in this uh, aneurysm, uh, all uh, S coil and uh, volume embolization ratio is uh, 27%, I think, enough so for this aneurysm. And uh, just after treatment, uh, AP view and lateral view, become patency is good. Uh, Post-operative course is uneventful, and the MRI uh, uh, after three months later, and the uh, distal ICA flow, ICA and MCA, ACA flow is, uh, opacification is good, and uh, uh, I need uh, recurrence, no recurrence. It's good course. In discussion, uh, the uh, large uh, large aneurysm uh, is the uh, high re recurrent risk factor after calling. And the other hand, to further F fetal type uh, PCA is a risk factor for recurrence after calling uh, is controversial. Mm. In a three, uh, three of seven aneurysm. Uh, Record uh, large anis records. Uh, calling case, just calling case, all uh, recurrence. And one hybrid uh, treatment uh, is also recurrence, but in this case, uh, uh, delayed uh, surgery uh, affected uh, uh, prognosis, uh, affected uh, strongly, influence uh, affected strongly. Uh, prognosis and the remaining uh, stand, uh, four is stent call uh, is uh, has no recurrence. It's good cause.
uh, stent placement for ICPC onion has uh, various uh, fashion. Uh, unique stent placement method for ICPC aneurysm includes the wide stent, lambda stent, and so on, uh, but there are no reports specific to large aneurysm with uh, fetal type PCA. Uh, the, in the ICPC case series, 33 uh, aneurysm case series uh, report the uh, uh, similar placement for two aneurysms like this, with a gentle angle for ICA to PCA, PCOM aneurysm, PCOM. At the steep angle, uh, placement on the in PCOM artery to prevent stent expansion failure. Uh, in our series, stent expansion was successful in all three cases, despite the uh, steep angle to PCOM artery. The reason for good expansion is uh, uh, maybe the radial force of uh, Elvis blue is strong, or, or and, uh, the more wide neck of large aneurysm is advantageous for expansion. Uh, FD treatment for large ICPC aneurysm with uh, fetal type PCOM is uh, not uh, recommended. Complete occlusion rate in meta analysis is uh, 42%. Uh, I'm sorry, here the uh, uh, not only large, uh, including small aneurysm, mm, is 42%. Uh, uh, in a series, no recurrence in four cases with stent call using Elvis Blue. In three cases, placement was performed from PCOM RT to a proximal ICA. The, the advantage of stent placement from PCA and PCOM artery, most of the neck of anism is covered with stent, so uh, dense packing and stabilization of coil coil mass uh, uh, is expected, and uh, this effect more was uh, more enhanced with Elvis blue uh, braided stent. This point is better for large annuals. Uh, Elvis Evo, uh, latest version, is not available in Japan. Uh, this advantage is uh, this uh, fashion is difficult to, to navigate catheter to fetal type PCA. Uh, it may be needed. Uh, need it may be need. Uh, it may need catheter exchange maneuver using a long guide wire. Uh, if the Recurrence uh, occur after this treatment. Uh, we have two options. Uh, the first is, first option is the flow diverter placement in only ICA in white stent fashion. The other one is uh, uh, flow diverter placement uh, uh, from PC, FPC to ICA. Uh, here the stent in stent. Uh, fortunately, uh, I have no recurrent case, so uh, uh, so this uh, option, this option is uh, just the idea. In conclusion, stent call for large ICPC aneurysm with FPC had fewer recurrence. Among them, LB uh, blue placement from PCOM RT to ICA may have been effective. The study was conducted using a small number of cases, and it is necessary to increase the cases and verify the efficacy and the safety. That's all uh, what I, I want to say, and uh, thank you for attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Takashi. Very interesting uh, comparison of cases. Um, yeah, even though it's a small number, but I think it gives us a very good uh, uh, impression of the outcomes from your um, intervention. Uh, is there anyone who would like to have any uh, questions?
Professor? And Mary Sharon, uh, we have a two discussant. Yes, okay, so one we continue. Counseling and the other one is... Uh, uh, so we will count, we will continue first because the other uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Marina Hira, Hirato. She's the senior resident of neurosurgery, Department of Neurosurgery. No, no, no. I, I think uh, that each oh. one, maybe we can have uh, some dis discussion. First, okay, all right. The topics is totally different. Okay, okay. Yeah. What does it say? Konbanwa. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Izumi, very nice and uh, excellent procedure. I saw and congratulations to the uh, procedure. Uh, I saw, uh, thank you very much. And uh, you presented uh, seven cases and the four cases is, uh, was uh, very excellent, but the uh, three cases was recurrent. So, uh, and the one case you show me, uh, show us uh, bypass surgery you did. Uh, I want to know how, what kind of bypass surgery did you do the patient? Because the, uh, as you know, the two p aneurysm is very d difficult for us to treat. So the, I mean, uh, direct yeah. neck clipping. Sometimes yeah. a medial projection and the uh, PCOM is uh, enlarged and uh, cautious. So uh, maybe uh, anterior temporal approach or extradural approach is necessary for this case. So the bypass is a good idea, but uh, sometimes it's difficult to produce, yeah, pro yeah. produce uh, pro uh, difficult uh, procedure. So yeah. Would you please show us the bypass surgery? Yeah, thank you. Good question. Your concern is, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, in this case, uh, I uh, the bypass surgery is STA MCA and a small surgery. And uh, the aim of uh, this. Uh, uh, Anastomosis is uh, uh, for. Um, uh, I want to uh, uh, ligate the proximal ICA. Uh, only occludes occludes the ICA proximal ICA. And the aim is uh, so is to uh, uh, flow stress to coil mass uh, will be decreased. So P competency is deep. Uh, mm, so I think uh, the, this uh, uh, large aneurysm with fetal type P PCA, uh, the coil mass uh, has a strong, very strong uh, uh, Flow stress, so uh, so uh, it uh, uh, recur to easily. So uh, uh, not to uh, severe. Uh, I ju we do uh, just STMC uh, bypass. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. So the flow diversion effect using the STMCA sometimes yeah. it worked, but uh, <clears throat> my in that case didn't affect the uh, uh, saturation maybe. So I, I I'm not sure, but uh, uh, how about the uh, STPCA and uh, uh, is it uh, I. Good or not? Uh, uh, how yeah. You... Mm. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, just the bypass surgery, just the flow modulation is uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, does not uh, is not effective. So uh, at first coiling, and 
to prevent the recurrent. Ah, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, after the ISAT study, mm -hmm. calling is uh, better than the surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone knows that. And the patient want to do the coiling first. So yeah. they, they don't care the how, how difficult the coiling the, uh, the log, uh, depending on the location. Mm -hmm. So they want to do the coiling first yeah. every time. So yeah, so you have a lot of experience and uh, uh, so expert. So maybe uh, uh, Elvis and uh, stand on the coiling change the result in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Is oh, Mrs. Can, can I ask you a very short question? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for a very wonderful uh, talk. Uh, congratulations. Just I want to ask uh, if you want to use the uh, flow diverter for the mm -hmm. uh, such type of the fetal type of the PCO. So mm -hmm. usually you place a FD plus. I'm not the endovascular surgeon, but uh, place the FD and Elvis glue. Is it, that is a common sense? As a just uh, uh, you. Yeah, you mean the uh, flow diverter and the Elvis? Mm, yes, both. So oh, mm. I mainly, uh, uh, for large animals, I mainly use the uh, flow diverter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just flow diverter, but uh, this fetal type PCOM aneurysm is uh, uh, bifurcation aneurysm. Mm -hmm. So at first I used the Elvis stent and uh, uh, but I did not experience uh, LV stent and uh, flow diverted Y stent. I have no ex I'm no experience. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. Um. Just just one question. Uh, Prof Izumi. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh. Basically, in my country, we don't uh, endovascular is not very common. Not in all hospitals. Mm -hmm. So we still uh, clip the uh, PCOM aneurysms. In fact. Mm -hmm. uh, PCOM aneurysms are the first aneurysms that the residents learn to clip uh, in, in oh. my country. Just just wanted to ask you, because you showed a lot of giant uh, PCOM aneurysms. Um, how many of those patients, um, after you coil, or have you had experiences where they have a neurological deficit, such as, such as third nerve palsies? Because normally they present with those kind of symptoms. So how do you resolve that problem when you um, have uh, when you do coiling? So uh. Uh-huh. And uh, in this in this series, uh, no patient uh, occurred the, the uh, oculomotor nerve palsy after treatment, but uh, as, uh, but uh, um, uh, symptomatic uh, any large or giant aneurysm with uh, a mass effect. Uh, uh, I want. I prefer to uh, clip or uh, ligation, uh, parent artery occlusion. Uh, so, oh, but the uh, small aneurysm, uh, seven millimeter, eight millimeter uh, aneurysm, uh, oculomotor neuropathy uh, will improve after the coiling. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank Darren, you. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Izumi, that was a good question, uh, good uh, presentation. Have mm -hmm. you used intrasecular devices, web device or something, mm -hmm. device for this aneurysm? Yeah, uh, web device. Uh, uh, sometimes the ICP aneurysm uh, 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 adapt, uh, indi uh, indicated for uh, web device. Uh, but the large aneurysm, uh, more than 10 millimeter, uh, web uh, is uh, not uh, uh, suitable uh, for uh, suitable because the we do see the uh, upper range is 10 millimeter. Uh, so web is not suitable for this. Thank you. Are there any more uh, questions from the floor?
So I think we can proceed with our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Marina Hirato. Dr. Marina Hirato is uh, actually the senior resident of neurosurgery, a department of neurosurgery in the University of Northern Yokohama uh, Hospital in Yokohama, Japan. Today, she will present on the suspected mechanism of aneurysm rupture after flow diverter deployment and surgical flow alternation. Yes, Sharon. Can I hear you? Can you hear me? It's okay? Yes. yes. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Marina Hirato from Northern York Home Hospital. And at first, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Yogokato, for kindly inviting me to speak here today. Now, okay. Okay, so now I'd like to speak about the suspect mechanism of aneurysm rupture after full diverter deployment. Let me introduce my university first. Showa University is a private school and the main hospital is Shinagawa, Tokyo. And its professor is open surgery Dr. Tom Mizutani, who is famous for aneurysm clipping. And also, it has three hospitals, Northern Yokohama Hospital and Fujigaoka Hospital in Yokohama. And each professor is Tomaki Terada and Tomoyuki Tsumoto. They are famous as uh, endovascular therapy. And fortunately, I've studied open surgery here in 2021. And next year, I moved to Fujigaoka Hospital to study endovascular therapy. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> because there are a little bit busy hospitals, so I didn't, I didn't take a good photo. So <laughs> only I had the device picture. And now I'm here. This is a hybrid hospital, so we have both sides of operation every week. Now I get back on track. Aneurysm rupture after flow diverter deployment is known as delayed aneurysm rupture. And it is one of the serious complications of flow diverter. The incidence range from 0 to 6.9% and varies from report to report due to the lack of large scale studies. But the clinical outcome is very poor in all reports. We report here some cases of delayed rupture after flow diverter placement and discuss its causes. We experienced five cases of delayed rupture, and its detail was indicated. We also had one case of aneurysm, aneurysm rupture after surgical flow alternation by clip bypass. And we plan to compare with unruptured cases. We investigated 56 cases of flow diverter placement for large aneurysms. Uh, performed at Fujikawa Hospital and Northern Yokohama Hospital from 2016 to 2023. Here you can see the features of our ruptured cases. The average ages were 66.4 years, years old and the majority was women. All of them were over 20 millimeters. The timing of rupture is not worthy. There were two main categories within a week and after a month. Here is the 3D DSA of aneurysms. ICA aneurysms had large neck and there were few thrombosed ones. On the other hand, basilar aneurysms were all fusiform shaped and also these were thrombosed. This table shows the detail of the surgical procedures. No operation were performed using a flow diverter alone, and all were with coils or using multiple stents. To capture this, all ruptured cases were large aneurysm over 20 mm and separated into early phase rupture and chronic phase rupture, and two cases of chronic phase are thrombosed aneurysm. And second, we show the flow alternation case. This is the before operation DSA. 
It was a ref to M1 aneurysm, and at first, surgical team crept on the major trunk of M2 and distal bypass by SDA. After that, we planned planned stent assist coil from the minor M2 trunk to M1, M1 secondary. However, subarachnoid sub hemorrhage has occurred nine days after the creep bypass. Here is the DSA of the rupture day. You can see the flow stasis in aneurysm, and here is the rupture point near the neck. These images show uh, before operative changes in aneurysm thrombosis. POD1, the thrombus formation on only the posterior wall side. However, on rupture day, you can see the thrombus on also anterior wall. We therefore suggested that changes in the hemodynamics within the aneurysm due to the effects of thrombosis over the time Maybe the lead may have led to the rupture of the aneurysm. Third, this slide shows the result of comparing with unruptured cases. Unruptured ones were almost located in ICA, and the and the cavernous portion was the most. There were no significant differences in age, but average size was but much bigger in rupture cases. On the basis of the result obtained so far, the hypothesis is as follows. The large aneurysms are potential risk of delayed rupture, and different mechanisms are involved in cases of early rupture and chronic rupture. And in our rupture cases, rapid flow of donation may contribute to rupture. And in chronic rupture cases, thrombosis may be involved in rupture. The cause of rupture remains unclear nowadays. However, two major hypotheses has been proposed in pro pre previous studies, including an increase in interaneurysmal pressure and information include induced during uh, thrombosis formation. A study with computational hemodynamics anal analysis revealed an increase in aneurysm pressure in case with aneurysm rupture by investigating aneurysm CFD analysis. In this study, they used the model before and after surgery with and without aneurysm rupture after flow diverter treatment. There can be two possible causes in this study. First, in aneurysm with stenosis of so the proximal parent artery, flow diverter would change the parent artery configuration, improving the blood flow and result resulting in the increase the aneurysm internal pressure. Second, an increase in peripheral arterial resistance due to flow diverter placement triggers autoregulation and increasing systolic pressure in the body circulation, thereby increasing aneurysm pressure. This study used a ruptured aneurysm model to calculate the vascular resistance and blood pressure and blood flow in the proximal and distal portion of the aneurysm. Consequently, flow diverter increased the resistance of the aneurysm and decreased the blood flow toward the aneurysm. When it was a wide neck shape, allow more blood flow from the parent vessel to the aneurysm, uh, so provide higher resistance and more likely to induce autoregulation to keep internal cerebral reflex. Then it makes systolic blood pressure higher and tends to increase model vessel blood flow and finally resulting in increased internal aneurysmal pressure. Another possible cause based on information induced by thrombus formation in the aneurysm. In many previous 
case reports, pathology revealed raw cell necrosis with the loss of fibro fibroblast and infiltration of acute inflammatory cell near the rupture point. Comparing these two theories, the rupture of aneurysms caused by elevated internal pressure is often reported in the early postoperative period. Well, Inflammatory cell inf infiltration occurs from one to five months after the surgery. And we have also investiga investigated other mechanisms, such as increased intraaneurysmal pressure due to changes in hemodynamics caused by thrombosis in acute post-operative periods, such as our flow alternation cases. Now, we are planning to conduct CFD analysis on this patient before operate, before, before, operative, before operative aneurysm model and analyze the hemodynamic change from the from alternation. So, this is conclusion. Based on five cases of ruptured aneurysms after flow diver to deployment, it was suggested that the rupture mechanism may differ between the RE postoperative rupture group and the chronic rupture group. Oh, sorry. And increased intraaneurysmal pressure due to hypo, uh, high, uh, high, uh, hemodynamic changes may occur involved in RE rupture group and whereas thrombosis may be involved the chronic rupture group. Future physical considerations using CFD analysis of flow alternation cases with comparing with more unruptured cases will be undertaken to further discussion. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> very much Marina. That was a very impressive presentation very good um, and I think very enlightening for a lot of us because it sort of explains the reasons why there is a post uh, aneurysm rupture. So I open the, any question to the floor for Marina. May I have a question, uh, Miyachi? It's okay? Okay. Uh, Dr. Hirazu, this is a very nice presentation and it's uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah, I I will present uh, this uh, theme of a uh, uh, delayed rupture of a flow diverter uh, in the JSNet in the uh, symposium session of flow diverter next week. And uh, in my uh, Japanese survey of uh, this uh, delayed rupture, uh, it is uh, about uh, 36, 36 cases in four in Japan. And uh, that is uh, uh, all the flow diverter cases of 5,000. So the rupture rate is 0.7%. But uh, it's a very, very important point is uh, no difference no, no difference between the coiled case and the uncoiled case. You, you have five cases are no coiled with, without coils? Uh, and five or three with coils. And another two case is a uh, uh, multiple multiple set stands, so three uh, five stands. Uh, even in yeah. such an overlapped stand, uh, rupture. Yes, overlap yeah. after overlap and rupture and uh, after rupture then after rupture. Re yeah, after rupture. Re hmm. Yeah, the overlap and rupture. Second rupture. So, ah, okay. So the initial initial stent is a uh, only one. No, the case. initial no. one. No, in, um, three cases is one stent and coil, and yeah. two two cases is multiple. The initial one is multiple mm -hmm. over two stent. Yeah. So it is a very important point of the a weak point of a flow diverter, and uh. Yeah. We are without the effect of a coiling, of a particularly mm -hmm. the paracrylinal aneurysms. So yeah. we should we should discuss and we should uh, negotiate. Uh, uh, we should uh, uh, so pursue the best treatment for the flow diverter treatment uh, to to uh, 
to avoid the delayed rupture. It is uh, yeah, very nice and uh, it's a very important suggestion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sensei, you want to say something? Yeah. yeah, I would like just, just to congratulate for the collection of these cases, which are all formidable. The point is in uh, they are really not so homogene homogeneous to, to make a conclusion, but the, the analysis is excellent. What I would like to focus is that the most important thing in delayed rupture after flow diversion is to, to create a prognostic approach in which we can early most probably predict that these patients are at higher risk for a delayed rupture. Uh, from, from the two main theories that we have, the inflammatory on the wall and the, uh, the flow dynamics, which now with the CFD has been enhanced enormously, I think that the CFD is having a, maybe the biggest perspective. We will be not able to analyze exactly what the progress in the aneurysm wall goes on, uh, at least the methodology is not available yet, while the CFD is uh, is very promising. So I think that really focusing on the, in this area will give us on big population uh, of patients some kind of clues when we can expect that. And really, that may not be related to the uh, adjuvant coil or not in the treatment. Yeah, that was all. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, yep. sensei. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your nice presentation. So, just I want to ask: uh, Can we uh, predict the uh, chronic rupture after placement of the FD? Uh, can we pre pre predict the with the CFD uh, images? Um, actually, the thrombosed one is uh, tends to chronic chronic uh, dry rupture. So, the, but the safety analysis is the, the main feature of uh, hemodynamics of the aneurysm. So this is the key of the early phase delayed rupture, I think. So the thrombosed one is the, um, nowadays, and um, actually I also investigate the relation of the uh, steroids of after the treatment or before treatment, and then I have not so much cases just now, so there were not a significant difference from the unruptured and ruptured one. But I think that this is a one hypothesis of the right and avoid the right rupture to use. Uh, a bit uh, using from uh, from using the steroid, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. All the best. Moody, Moody. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you raise some very interesting points uh, in your discussion and really very impressive. Of course, on, as a follow up on other questions about the predictability of uh, uh, those who are likely to develop delayed uh, rupture. Uh, you postulate that the inflammatory process is the likely underlying uh, pathology. Uh, you've even alluded to uh, an attempt by utilizing steroids uh, uh, to try to see whether there is, but obviously the numbers don't stack up at the moment. My question is uh, uh, two-pronged. One is, are the patients who perhaps have an inflammatory underlying pathology uh, more likely to develop uh, these uh, ruptures? And if so, uh, perhaps screening them with uh, anti-nuclear antibody and other parameters for connective tissue disorders perhaps lead us towards a diagnosis that this patient uh, uh, is more likely to 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 rupture, uh, develop a, a, a delayed rupture, uh, because if they have an underlying inflammatory condition and they then are predisposed, perhaps we may be altering their uh, status towards a delayed rupture. So use of uh, hemat uh, you know, hematology testing, including CRP, 
uh, uh, ESR rates to, to determine whether there are those subset of patients that are more likely to develop uh, pathology. That's on one side. The second thing you alluded to, and I think, again, made very uh, clear sense, was the alteration in the hemodynamics of these patients. And the, uh, so one wonders whether there is a role for prophylactically uh, giving them uh, antihypertensive, even though they may not be antihypertensive, they may not be hypertensive in the conventional uh, understanding of hypertension, but keeping their blood pressures lower than what would ordinarily be considered normal. I mean, these are obviously, you've, you've opened up uh, a very interesting discussion and there are lots of unanswered questions. So it makes us begin to think aloud as to whether there is a way, because really, as uh, was mentioned earlier by a professor who was giving us his uh, thoughts, when you offer a patient clipping versus coiling, they are more likely to opt for coiling understandably that's that's the, the trend all over but then if you then begin to get an understanding of underlying factors that might predispose them to a re-rupture despite having gone through uh, a major intervention or a significantly major intervention such as com coiling of a complex aneurysm i just wonder whether some of them may then begin to opt for clipping uh, rather than coiling. Again, these are unanswered questions of thinking aloud, but I thought I should just uh, share my thoughts uh, in this discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sure. Sure. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Marina. Um, I think uh, we have a very interesting uh, study and maybe we need to um, you know, you need to look into it a lot more and give us a more interesting answers and conclusions. All right. Um, um, Abhi, you want to take yeah. over? So for the next topic, I would like to invite uh, Professor Miyachi, who is the chairman and professor of neurological surgery and director of the Neuroendovascular Therapy Center at Aichi Medical University. Hello, Professor Miyachi. Are you ready with your presentation? Yeah. Hello, Abhi. <laughs> Thank you for your introduction. Okay. So my talk is on um, the similar theme of uh, the previous two speakers. Uh, the title is Endovascular Treatment for Recurrent or De Novo Aneurysms. And this is UI. So I have an uh, some cases are so recurrent case first and the after calling this theme was already uh so so presented by the doctor is me and uh the rate of recanalization uh but but the rate of recanalization becomes lower than before uh, due to the techniques and uh, the good good coils so the measures for the recurrent aneurysms to uh is an uh, to add the coils and also the, maybe stent assisted coiling is a very uh strong uh, measures this is a very very old cases of uh, picom aneurysm very small one creeping and uh, this is a re recurrence so the embolization but um, you know, uh, here is a core shifted to the posterior and the next re embolization. So, 12 years ago, I told the radar for uh, after the first, first creeping. So, another de novo aneurysm here. So, again, then we, we uh, called. Uh, so, this is a, more than 20 years ago. So, such an uh, at that time, there is no stent. So we have to repeat uh, such a quick coding. So yeah, but, but uh, now we can use a stent. And as uh, Dr. Izmi said, uh, the, we, are the, uh, we uh, strongly recommend uh, stent-assisted stent coding 
for the recurrent aneurysms. This is a common aneurysm. First, first coding is a, it looks very nice, but uh, two years later, the match recanalization here. So uh, we put a stent, stent to the A1 to A1 and A2 and the coding again. And this is a complete packing, no recurrence and the shrinkage of aneurysm is found. This is a recurrent basal chip aneurysms. It's a core is a, uh, very sifted to the dome air dome side. So we put a, core, a stent and uh, adding coil. It is very nice, no recanalization in the two years follow up. Many papers uh, of the effectiveness of stent assisted coiling. This is also, uh, this paper shows an occlusion rate is higher in stented group. And this paper also have a stent assisted coiling is a very low rate of recurrence. So maybe the stent will be the uh, flow diverting effect plus uh, the neck coverage will uh, so avoid the recurrence of aneurysms. This is also the same, same <coughs> papers. And, uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so we should, uh, uh, we should uh, deploy the stent for the recurrent aneurysm, but uh, this case is a uh, very difficult. Uh, and, uh, here is the MCA aneurysm, uh, unruptured one, and uh, uh, the coding is good, but uh, Next uh, year, the code is a little bit shift. So this is 20, 2012, 13, 15, 17, 19. So a little bit larger. And, uh, but but uh, no change of the shape. But uh, look at this uh, two, uh, two, 2020. Uh, uh, this is a dome, but uh, you can see the brave here. So I recommend uh, the the patient to uh, lead coiling, but she denied so bad ruptures. Mm. Yeah, of course that is a brave formation. It's a very uh, uh, very dangerous sign. It's a rupture. So that we put a we must uh, operate. We must uh, coiling again. Of course, there's a. Uh, the selection, the choice of the clipping is okay, but uh, she has some big uh, complications, so uh, general complications. So we uh, tried to call again, but uh, you can see the very broad neck here, and uh, we failed to stand to this uh, branch. So uh, this is a very pe peculiar technique and the like scaffold technique. We place one core at the branch itself, and the other catheter uh, here, and uh, the, the other core is uh, inside the aneurysm. And after the coring, we remove the this scaffold core, and uh, the core is placed there only uh, in the aneurysm dome, <laughs> and then pack the core uh, the, the dome. How uh, we uh, preserve the <laughs> branch, this M2, and this is the final one. The patient is uh, very good and no recurrence now. Yeah, in, if the, we failed the stent assisted, uh, we failed the stent assisted coring uh, with such a uh, double catheter technique is uh, so useful. <laughs> this is a very rare case. But uh, if the, we find, uh, if we encounter the, such a rapidly growing aneurysm, we should treat the emergency. So for the traumatic uh, aneurysm, infectious aneurysm, maybe the, the, these are should aneurysms, emergency embolization. Or if the, we cannot embolize the uh, aneurysm itself, we must consider the vascular reconstruction with bypass. <clears throat> this is an tubercular uh, cellar meningioma case. Here, and um, uh, we check uh, intercarotid artery. There is no aneurysm preoperatively. 
This is a usual uh, uh, transnasal neuroendoscopic surgery. And mm -hmm. yeah, and <clears throat> this is an extra arachnoidal maneuver. You see, there is no carotid inj uh, injury. And also, the, so oper uh, operation was uh, over and event free, a febrile, and there is no intraoperative complications, no other injury for carotid wall. But uh, post operative day four, so massive SAH. And you see the big, here is a big aneurysm at the site of the uh, oper oper operating field. So this is so only four days. And but that may be the very thin wall aneurysm here. That is a protruding in the <coughs> uh, mediary. But uh, so the, we consider the trapping. Uh, so imagine trapping. But uh, this here is a fetal type of PCOM. There is no ACOM as a metas maneuver. So we cannot trap. Uh, if the, we we cannot uh, 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 with, with, if uh, we cannot trap without bypass, so first uh, first uh, we should uh, uh, we should to get a uh, hemostasis. So of course I uh, we know the the coiling for the such an pseudo aneurysm is not effective, but uh, for at that time firstly we in the baron assisted coiling. Here and also no hem, uh, hem no re bleeding. This is after the uh, coiling. Now here, but you see the post ah and post of the C recover to be conscious, but a mild fever. <clears throat> so and uh, so infectious uh, so the sign is a uh, very very increasing. Uh, so that's, I think that is an infectious aneurysm. And anyway, and, uh, so the, uh, many, uh, showed a meningi meningitis and, uh, infection of pseudo aneurysm allergy nosa. But you see, day seven, there is, uh, some, uh, recurrence. Uh, also, MRI shows, uh, uh, reappearance of the cavity of the uh, aneurysm here, day 10, it's just uh, growing. And also the MRA shows a big one. Day 24, match recanalization. Yeah, of course, that is the coding is not effective, but uh, we can we can stop the rebreeding. But anyway, that is a, it's a very, uh, a big, uh, 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 big risk of a uh, relapse. Here is an twenty-four uh, is angiogram. <laughs> so uh, we this we decided to the high flow bypass with radial actigraft. Yeah, and here is an uh, interoperative way. Uh, this is an aneurysm, it's a very thin wall, after one, and uh, we harvest uh, the shoot uh, aneurysm wall, and uh, that was a uh, so pathological answer was a shoot aneurysm. And we trapped ICA just in between, just proximal to the origin of PCOM A, mm -hmm. and the cervical ICA with high pro uh, ECIC bypass with radial artery graft. Like this, it was very successful and no so uh, ischemic uh, regions uh, to, to, uh, this uh, bypass surgery. Patient is, has a uh, hydrocephalus and it will be shunned. And then uh, now she's uh, okay and uh, she comes to the uh, outpatient's door. No, don't de no deficit. So such an uh, infectious rapid enlargement of the mycotic and the infectious aneurysm is uh, some in some reports. This one two weeks ago it's uh, normal, but uh, so two weeks it's a big big aneurysm here. And the reports also the only two days, no aneurysm, but the two days later the basilar chip here is a big aneurysm. 
So it's such an uh, meningitis or such an infectious uh, uh, disorders. We must uh, very take care. So so every day or the so very in the short period, uh, we we may encounter such an so very a rapid increase of the aneurysm or the increase of the formation of aneurysm. Mm -hmm. This is another peculiar case, the traumatic shoot aneurysms. So big uh, so, uh, trauma, uh, tra traffic accident, and a, a large uh, rupture of the skull, skull fracture and uh, that is a uh, so expanded, extended to the skull base, and massive subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, subdural hematoma. So we the emergency uh, removal of the sub subdural hematoma and external decompression. But uh, uh, the next day with the enhanced and. Uh, CT scan shows the abnormal enhanced region in the anterior skull base here. But at that time, it looks uh, so independent from the carotid artery. So I think uh, some extravasation of the small from the small perforators. And also, an angiogram shows uh, no aneurysm. But uh, day 12, so abnormal mass at the anterior skull base. So we check again of the angiogram. So big aneurysm at the paracrinoid area. So um, of course that is a traumatic shoot aneurysm due to the skull base fracture. So yeah, in this case also, we know that that is a co only coiling is ineffective. So, but uh, this is a very difficult to trap it. The, this uh, area. So we try, we try again in the endovascular approach. And first, the coiling in the aneurysm, then the pipeline is placed here to, we expect it, we expect it to the uh, flow diverting effect. And also the coiling will, be, co this coil will be sifted, sifted so day by day. So uh, after the balloon assist, we injected the onikis. This is a reiki embodying mat material. So very, very uh, uh, slowly and packing the aneurysm uh, totally with an coil and uh, onikis. This is the final view. And here is a flow diverter and this is a onikis plus coil. And uh, but uh, it is very it was very successful and no recanalization and she's so very nice uh, uh, except for the so visual acuity uh, problem with the visual acuity but she has no no uh, deficit. So I think uh, such an uh, only one case but uh, coiling plus such a uh, boost uh, liquid material may uh, avoid the recurrence of, uh, of the aneurysm. Yeah, and the flow diverter, the loss of aneurysm. Uh, of course, uh, delayed rupture is a very, very big problem. The another is uh, so very rare, but uh, sometimes the flow diverter, after flow diverter, aneurysm still grow. Uh, the measures so, are uh, only overlapping and little indication of a trans cell coiling because uh, the mesh of the flow diverter is so tight. This is a paracrinoid with giant aneurysms. So we put a stent, uh, we put a flow diverter and then the coiling like this. Uh, we, are, we are very afraid of the delayed rupture. So we packed the coil so very tightly here. But uh, marked enlargement of aneurysm at, uh, several months ago, months later, you see the so the four deformation of the coiling and the here is a uh, recurrent space. So we put the two uh, flow diverts overlapping, and nine months later, that is a uh, completely occluded and. Uh, 
a parent that is a patent, and uh, so aneurysm decrease inside. So the, such an <laughs> overlapping is sometimes very effective. This is another case of a cavernous aneurysm giant, uh, giant one. And the only one uh, flow diverter pipeline is pre uh, deployed here. This is after the coiling. But uh, two years still remaining uh, intersacular flow. And this is a very uh, strange shape. And also the patient's symptom, uh, ochromotor palsy uh, worsened. In, at the two, uh, during two, these two years. So we decided the uh, overlapping of a uh, pipeline here, like this. And uh, yeah, of course, in the other part will, is a thrombose, thrombose part. So that is maybe the C enters the malignant cycle of the, the development of a thrombose aneurysm. But uh, uh, overlapping stent, uh, successfully uh, bring about a uh, 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 shrinkage over aneurysm. This is three months, nine months, but a uh, symptomatic improvement and also the sh a, a little shrinkage over aneurysm itself. So overall instinct is, uh, was, uh, was effective. Okay, so after creeping, you can't after creeping. Um, of course, the clipping is okay, but uh, sometimes very difficult because of the, the disturbance of the previous uh, clip. Uh, and uh, two patterns of the uh, de recurrent aneurysm after clipping. First is a re uh, recurrent one, pu uh, pure recurrent one, and for the second is a pure de novo. Pure de novo aneurysm is a part of the neck is pinched and deformed. This is a completely different uh, shape of the aneurysm in the, uh, from the uh, previous one. The pure recurrent one will be the neck is reformed to be wider like this. It is uh, very difficult to for the coiling. And also such an de novo recurrent aneurysm has an unusual shape and limited working angle and access blood because of the disturbance of the aneurysm due to the shadow of creep. And then also that this such a de novo, de novo one will be rapidly increasing, uh, uh, rapidly growing one will be the suppose uh, seen fragile aneurysm more. We have, uh, I showed some cases of this is a ACOM aneurysm. After the maybe I don't know the uh, uh, previous emerging aneurysm. I, I don't know the shape, but uh, such a uh, creep work maybe it's a big big aneurysm. Anyway, anyway, th this one we uh, growing these uh, several years, so we put a cord like like this. It is a uh, double catheter technique. <laughs> this is a de novo aneurysm. Maybe here is a creep. But the creep is very okay, but the other aneurysm is just uh, uh, just uh, uh, the chip of the uh, creep. And so we uh, press the call, but uh, the the neck is very small, and so it is diff well, it was very difficult to insert the micro catheter into the aneurysm. But anyway, we were successful with the calling. And this is rupture the ICPC after creeping. Uh, so very long, long time ago. And uh, so we put the cord here like this, but uh, it is uh, difficult to uh, tightly pack uh, because then, uh, this patient has a, a PCOM, a fetal PCOM. And also, I think uh, this uh, clip is also the uh, to avoid uh, uh, PCOM uh, occlusion. So maybe that is uh, not uh, so good uh, clipping. This is another unruptured one. Uh, also, the so big, uh, big neck, very wide neck. 
So we place the call uh, with the double catheter technique like this. Yeah. So the in the summary, uh, rapid growing aneurysm uh, after infection or trauma should be treated as soon as possible. And at the time, if the, we cannot uh, so emergently do the so surgical procedure uh, with an uh, bypass, uh, we can consider the an, uh, aneurysm coiling or uh, coiling plus uh, liquid materials uh, instead of the so such and surgical procedure. That is to avoid the uh, early, early relapse. Stent assisted coiling or, or flow divert is effective to prevent the recanalization. Re and uh, overlapping flow divert is effective for the regrowing thrombotic aneurysm to do with flow divert. But uh, I don't know the that is a, so truly uh, that is truly effective for to to avoid the uh, to prevent the delayed rupture. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And vascular treatment is effective for the de novo or recurrent aneurysm after gripping. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Miyachi. That was a very interesting presentation with a lot of uh, different and innovative solutions for the recurrent aneurysms. And thank you very much. Now we are open to questions. I would like to invite the first uh, discussions. Professor Wada, do you have any question or comment? Thank you very much, Dr. Miyachi. And uh, very beautiful technique. Uh, I I very appreciate for your presentation, and uh, I have uh, some question in your cases, uh, because uh, you showed the uh, recurrent case a lot, and uh, maybe uh, some surgery can help to to regrow the recurrent aneurysm. After the uh, creeping, the coil mm -hmm. is uh, very uh, straight, strengthful, mm -hmm. or helpful for uh -huh. us. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in case mm -hmm. of the after coiling and uh, the decanalization or the growth, maybe a uh, surgery also help uh, in that case. How do you think? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, for example, the MC aneurysm, uh, recurrent MC aneurysm, is that uh, we first recommend the patient <laughs> the creeping. <laughs> but uh, uh, but in usually, usually patients denied, please, uh, please call again. <laughs> and uh, if, if impossible, the, the, uh, the patient will accept uh, the creeping. So the, the I don't I don't promise the the, the effect of the coring, but uh, first uh, we try to the coring for such a uh, so patient uh, who who likes uh, endovascular treatment. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, in the MCA case, yeah, uh, maybe a very very difficult technique you did. Uh, so he. It is available for the beginner's interventionist also do the same procedure, or you cannot recommend that one? Yeah, that is a very, very difficult and uh, very peculiar technique. And uh, so if the, we tried to the such a double catheter technique or scaffold technique, we failed, the, we failed such a technique, we abandoned. We, yeah. Uh, we recommend the, the surgery. If the, such a beginner has an, uh, maybe failed uh, to embolize uh, so very successfully, uh, and uh, that is uh, may cause uh, ischemic complications. So if the, uh, such a uh, risk is so high, uh we must uh we must recommend uh sir creeping thank you very much thank you uh professor kato would you like to make any comment yes 
<laughs> yes. Wonderful talk. <laughs> Just uh, from your case, I think uh, I was very impressed about the mycoticanism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should be very careful because the uh, post -op operative course was quite long and also uh, so maybe the frequent uh, follow up is needed. How do you think? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, I show the two cases. One is the infectious one, why mycotic, one is the traumatic. But, uh, both both aneurysm is uh, very controversial, and usually the uh, uh, very good answer is uh, trapping plus bypass. Anyway, but uh, so I I showed uh, the possibility of the uh, endovascular uh, treatment even in the such and such aneurysm, but uh, if the but uh, that is a very temporary effect maybe to avoid the uh, so early early rupture uh, if uh, we find we find the really recurrence of the aneurysm or a growing aneurysm we must decide the trapping bypass mm -hmm. this is the baby a temporary way mm -hmm. maybe okay my sensei thank you can i ask some question for dr yeah. Yes, yes yes Thank you. Um, I'm just a resident, so I have not so much ex experience about um, traumatic shoot aneurysms and infection, infectional shoot aneurysms. But I always face a lot of uh, traumatic patient. So, what when do you, did you suggest to? take CTA or DSA after the trauma, after the in injury season to check the shoot aneurysms? Ah, we usually, that is, a, for example, a traumatic aneurysm. So anterior skull base and, uh, and so, so very big uh, trauma in the, here <laughs> is around the eye and uh, so, and also the very conscious state was very low, uh, uh, bad we check uh, usually the cont uh, CT, contrast ct to check a ccf or the, the other uh, dissection in the yeah. skull base area yeah. and uh, at, at, at that case we find the uh, abnormal uh, contrast uh, 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 pooling as a scar base, so we we uh, doubted uh, that, that is a uh, we suspected a shoot aneurysm. But uh, in other case, uh, for example, usual uh, cranial uh, skull fracture, there is no no need for such an uh, so aggressive uh, checking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only the anterior scar base. Okay, thank you. It really thanked me. And another question, one more question. It's very easy question for you, I think, but it's technical question. And when you injected the onkis to the aneurysm on the pipeline, beer the pipeline, what kind of microcutter did you use, like very shaped microcutter, like uh, diffractor or Marson and so on? And how did you do? I want. I want to know. At that time, this is a uh, usual, uh, uh, usual microcatheter for coiling. Because then that is a coiling. Then the finally, on the, from the same catheter, uh, we, we injected the uh, onychis. So yeah, but that is uh, not uh, recommended. You know, maybe the, the Chirada will will do. <laughs> yes, he sometimes say so. So you yeah, never <laughs> recommend it. That, yeah, because uh, the, we are high risk of the so migration of the onychis to the parent artery. We yeah, well, of course, in the baron assisted, but uh, actually at that time the onychis is a little bit uh, so protruded into the carotid artery. But that was safe, but uh, fortunately safe. Yeah, it's a very high risk of uh, migration. <laughs> okay, thank you. We are in a Maybe you can ask a forward because uh, endovascular treatment is finished. The three, three speakers. Professor Fawad, are you there? Yes. Can you give some comment or on, on this lecture? Okay, okay. thank you. Konnichiwa. 
salam ah, alaikum. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, nice webinar and nice presentation. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, in Afghanistan, we haven't the possibility of doing coiling or clipping of the aneurysm and also the because of uh, uh, this, we haven't also the possibility of uh, MRA or angiography. It's uh, in rare cases, uh, some patients doing uh, angiography in some clinics, but uh, unfortunately, we haven't the possibility of uh, putting a clip or a, a coiling. Uh, uh, but we like to do and also uh, train uh, ask for training, but uh, we are uh, a very difficult situation in Afghanistan nowadays, and uh, we like to have uh, some uh, scholarship or fellowship for our young neurosurgeons for uh, training and uh, also for uh, uh, donating some uh, uh, endovascular or maybe for. Uh, uh, open surgery for uh, aneurysm, but uh, uh, only uh, thing we do in Afghanistan now, if uh, there is uh, uh, hematoma, uh, int intraparenchymal hematoma, and it's big, we evacuate it. So uh, when it extended to the ventricles, uh, just we evacuate uh, doing uh, extraventricular drainage. And uh, if in a case of uh, hydrocephalus uh, in the uh, late case, they do put chanting, but unfortunately, in the early case, on uh, and uh, we uh, didn't do, we don't do anything because we haven't the possibility, and we are doing only for uh, neurotrauma cases uh, just a day, just now, and uh, we hope uh, someday we find uh, some uh, instruments and all equipment for uh, doing uh, such uh, advanced cases like you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Kato yeah. and Professor Abida Shah and uh, all professors. Thank you very much for uh, taking me the time for uh, my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pawad. I think uh, we can move on to the next presentation. Yes. So I'd like to invite, now we are moving on from endovascular to open surgery. And I'd like to invite Professor Kawashima, who is the head department of neurosurgery at St. Luke's International Hospital in Tokyo. And he will be talking to us about the basic skill of bypass surgery. We cannot hear you, Professor Kawashima. Is it okay? Yes, it is okay. Yeah, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. 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 And uh, can I share my slide? Yes, we can see your screen. We can see your screen. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be invited to this great webinar. And thank you, Professor Kato. So I talk about the uh, basic technique for ECIC bypass. So you know, the first STM shape bypass was published in 1967 by Professor Yasajiro. This Technique was adapted not only to ischemic patient but also to complex aneurysm. So these are my cases. Eighty percent is STM shaped bypass, and half of them is myeloid disease. I'd like to talk from my experience I obtained today. There are much difference of development of blood supply from the graft. Not say, of course, demand is one of the important factor, but it may also be according to the procedures. How to achieve good blood supply 
from the bypass is essential. So to achieve good blood supply of bypass, there are many steps of procedures. So, so today I focus on the three steps and it couldn't be achieved good result without the complete of any steps. First, graft, uh, graft preparation. The goal of the uh, graft preparation is to avoid the graft damage and uh, avoid the skin troubles. So uh, skin design, in, in our cases, the, uh, the skin incision is on the parietal branch of the STA. And uh, I usually do the double bypass. So the uh, parietal branch is dissected on the uh, this incision and the frontal branch was dissected from the garial side. And carefully preparation of the graft avoiding inch marrow damage and mechanical spasm. And uh, taking care not to toughly stretch and strongly pick up or hit injury. And if you can prepare well, the skeletonized way is better because easy to hemostasis after uh, opening the bypass and can release the tortures of the graft and good, good for skin. And the natural graft course is key to success. I'll show you later. So I'll show you the uh, video. Preparation of the graft is one of the main part of the successful making bypass, I think. This is a, a left side operation, sorry, a right side operation and making the skin incision on the parietal branch of the STA. And uh, uh, the important thing is uh, opening the widely the, uh, and the dissects the uh, good layer, I mean, between the uh, garia and the uh, parietal branch of the STA. After uh, dissecting the upper side of the uh, surface of the graft, the side wall while dissecting, I do, I hold the uh, bipolar, adsum type bipolar on the left left hand, and the small chips of the uh, scissors on the right hand. A large branch was coagulate and cut and cut. Totally about seven centimeters are enough for the graft and add the skin incision anteriorly and refract the uh, skin and dissect the frontal branch from the garial side. So, He, he pressed the uh, blue line to avoid the uh, uh, kink or the uh, tortures of the graft during the bypass. And the natural graft course means that uh, uh, like this, this, this is the uh, uh, STA MCA and the STA ACA bypass. And this the recipient artery is small in the ACA territory, but the uh, this uh, natural course and the graft is under the drawer. This is a very good 
uh, very good for the uh, uh, huge bus supply. This is a post-operative uh, angiography. Whole frontal region are uh, supplied by this uh, these double bypasses. So. Sorry. So this is uh, uh, I I show you the uh, the uh, case of the uh, graft uh, the experience of the graft course uh, the importance of the graft course. In this case the uh, arteriosclerotic this uh, STA is very tough. And the recipient artery is like this, this direction. And uh, in, in this uh, situation, the uh, course is unnatural. So I cut the graft like this. And arrange the uh, graft course this way. If the... Uh, Avoid uh, not cut the uh, graft. The uh, anastomosis site is will be kinked because the uh, according because of the this tough uh, hard graft. So next step is uh, receiving the artery uh, selection. My strategy is to huge blood supply to the brain surface as much as possible. This orange line is the graft, and the blood flow is two ways to distal way and the proximal way. This pro proximal direction is more important because uh, uh, this blood supply is. Uh, divided huge territories. So I think the uh, M4 is more smaller size uh, than the uh, SDA graft. So to select the uh, recipient artery, bigger size M4 is better because uh, uh, bigger size M4 May lead to the uh, good good route to the uh, proximal site of the this blood uh, supply. But some cases can be surprised totally MC territory by the graph like this. But of course, uh, uh, some case the other case is. Uh, the supplied blood, blood flow is uh, limited. So perfusion area should be roughly considered based on the ischemic area before uh, operation, uh, like, uh, for example, the front uh, anterior part of the frontal uh, region in this case was a uh, 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 anatomical stru uh, structures uh, by the uh, patients. So uh, I I mentioned uh, that uh, I usually uh, use a, a double bypass. So the uh, so territory is uh, anterior or posterior uh, side of the frontal uh, lobe or a parietal or a temporal. Uh, roughly consider which part I uh, the target uh, area is which part? And the more details, for, for example, how do you decide if the uh, biggest recipient artery is at the edge of the craniotomy and the uh, deep circles? Uh, the sec uh, second biggest one at the center of the craniotomy may be better at that, uh, at that case. So 
strategy should be selected according to balance between surgeon's skills or other experiences and consider of anasmos uh, conditions of anasmosis. So finally, I, I show you the anasmosis. You know, Pazui's law describes the relationship of flow through the uh, uh, flow through a pipe. It shows vessel largest is the most dominant uh, variable affecting flow, as the increasing radius is an exponential increasing in flow. The graph diameter, for example, the size of the orifice is proportional to the graft flow to the post powers. So the, uh, the one, uh, the most important uh, uh, one is the size of the graft and the uh, orifice, size of the orifice. So, to making the anastomosis, of course, steady suturing is important, but uh, expanding always is the most uh, essential thing. To steady suturing, making it visible, and adjusting the orifice of the recipient to, to the donor, and keeping the needle chip up like this, this figure, to avoid suturing the contralateral wall. And stitching the needle through the all layers vertically is also important. And to expand the, to expand the orifice, suturing the loose stitches like this, the balance of margin and pitch is very important. In, in this case, very tiny recipient artery. After making the uh, arteriotomy, the, uh, we, can, we can check, it's very difficult to see the uh, orifice and very uh, important, uh, very difficult in this case. In, for, in such a cases, we in, introduce a silicone uh, rubber stamp, which is blue color and very soft. It helps us to make it visible, shape the collapse vessel, and prevent suture in the contralateral wall. And also, uh, we uh, introduce the ultra small micro needle, which are uh, this one, 2.5 millimeter in length and 70 micrometer in diameters. So I show you the uh, video, which is a uh, Setting before starting the anastomosis. We adjust the uh, graft course naturally like this. This is a recipient artery. And making the uh, orifice, the length is double of the diameter of the STA. Formings of the uh, orifice and cut the small branches from the recipient artery. It's, this procedure is a, a, a little bit complicated, but the very important to avoid heat damage of the recipient artery. And before cramping, 
flashing the uh, two needles for the uh, state sutures. Now, after arteriotomy, I adjust the uh, length of the orifice. Okay, next is the uh, uh, anastomosis, the video of the anastomosis. Stitch the needle vertically to all layers is very important. And keep the needle chip up like this to avoid the suturing the contralateral wall. And before the all tying the uh, sutures, the silicone rubber stent are uh, getting off. Like this. After off of the uh of the stent, the sutures are all we tie the all sutures. So I I show you the angiographical result of the bypass function six months after bypasses. Oh, this is a uh, uh, all cases are adult adult cases, and we define the bypass function based on the angiographical evaluation six months after operation. Extensive means the uh, blood supply from the graft in more than two thirds of the MCA territory. And the moderate is between two thirds and one third. And far is less than one third. Almost all cases achieve, can achieve ex extensive blood supply from the bypass. So bypass is very effective and powerful to achieve a suitable surgical effect. There are some steps and need training. You know, here is the legend of samurai. The name is Musashi. He is in seven, uh, 17th century. He made the book named Five Rings, described how to win the battle. He wrote the details of the skill and strategy in the book. He said in the book, samurai must do hard training. This uh, was pronounced tanren. Tanren, tan, this word means that 1,000 day, 1,000. It means 1,000 training to the basic level. And this rank means uh, 10,000. 10,000 day training to the master level. So this is a summary. The, the anastomosis is, of course, very important, especially expanding the orifice. But graft preparation and the recipient artery selection is also very important for good supply, good blood supply from the graft. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Professor Kawashima. That was a very good basic lecture on bypass techniques and very useful for those learning in the beginning of bypass surgery and very good and important tips that are essential for a successful bypass craft. So I'll start with the discussion. Uh, Professor Kostadin. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh... Definitely an enormous experience was shared with us and uh, also the illustrative material was excellent. It, 
I would like to ask about the uh, application, probably in Moya, if that is uh, <laughs> okay for the subject, because the majority of these patients have been uh, adult ischemia patients. Uh, how early in childhood you can apply the uh, STA-MCA bypassing usually? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Constantine. And uh, it's a very good question. For the uh, pediatric patient, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, de development of the ischemic condition is very, very fast. So in pediatric patient, I do the uh, uh, plan to bypass as much as possible, uh, uh, as far as possible. Especially for a young uh, uh, pediatric patient, this is uh, dangerous. I think. So usually, these patients are presenting also a lot of technical details because the fragile, um, small uh, size uh, vessels and so on, which are particularly difficult to to work on, uh, cortical vessels, yeah. particularly. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. May I, ask, yes. may I ask one question? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Kaushima. That was uh, wonderful. I just uh, noted that you use this small stent at the yes. time of bypass. Is it commercially available or from which company is it? <laughs> uh, yeah. This stent can, uh, this stent uh, presented by a Japanese company. You, you can buy. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Eventually, but, eventually, even you can probably make it, but it is very important to use it safely, most probably. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the insertion, ten, ten, and, ten, the yeah. insertion and taking out is the detail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ten years ago, we make ourselves this thing, but now a company can produce this thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Kato, would you like to make some comment? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the, your effort and uh, your uh, experience uh, for bypass is outstanding. And, uh, maybe the young doctors can understand very well. Thank you. Maybe the indication for sometimes uh, uh, high flow or some very uh, uh, yeah, not the usual bypass uh, the YNS can uh, can must learn from you. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And the for for ischemic patient, uh, almost all cases are uh, uh, needs a low flow bypass. Low flow bypass is the best. But uh, for the for example, complex uh, aneurysm cases, acute acute flow replacement. Sometimes it needs a, a high flow bypass. It depends on the uh, uh, blood flow we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kawashima. Does anybody have any? Yeah, I have a question, but well, not a question, uh, well, like a comment. So uh, yeah, at some point, um, Thank you for your presentation. And at some point, you mentioned about thousand days of practice in order to have the basic skills for that. So, for someone, a, a nurse, a young neurosurgeon, who want to get into, um, you know, becoming proficient in bypass procedures. What What do you recommend besides starting right off? On the patient, what what model do you like? Animal model or simulation oh, yeah, model? Yeah. You know what? How did you start uh, getting your expertise? Thank you very much. It's very important things. I think in Japan, many issues cannot uh, use the animals to train the uh, procedures, and uh, of my issues, my issues also can use, cannot use the animals. So uh, uh, my young colleagues uh, do the bypass training using the silicone uh, tube. 
uh, about uh, 50 or 100 silicon tubes suturing the training. After that, uh, they start the uh, bypass in my institute. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. There is another also option to use a chicken wing, which is contained. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and nerves, which are very appropriate for training. Yeah, yeah. I think they are also a good model after the silicone training. Yes, yes. Chicken wing is very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Kusari. Okay, thank you, Professor Kawashima. So let's thank move, you very much. Let's move on to the next presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Professor Taichi Ishiguru. He is the professor and consultant neurosurgeon in the Department of Neurosurgery at Tokyo Women's Medical University. And he's going to talk on impact of bypass surgery on cognitive function. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you. And please, please let me share my slides. Yes, we can see. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, it's my great pleasure to see you all doctors. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Yoko Kato Sensei for giving me this opportunity. So for today's talk, I'm going to talk about the effect of ECIC bypass on intelligence and cognitive functions in patients with chronic cerebral vascular ischemia. Uh, I'd like to share our recent study data with you all today. In our country, ECIC bypass has been commonly performed to reduce subsequent cerebral infarction in patients with large cerebral vessel occlusion or severe stenosis who also show decreased CBF or uh, CVR. However, uh, there has been no consensus on the effic efficacy of ECIC bypass in intelligence or cognitive function for these patients. Uh, this time, we present the result of a prospective cohort study to evaluate whether ECIC bypass improves IQ or cognitive function in patients with chronic cerebral vascular ischemia. Um, since 2013, we've routinely measured IQ and cognitive function for patients with chronic cerebral ischemia who undergo ECIC bypass surgery. Our indications for ECIC bypass are the patients who previously had ischemic symptoms and have reduced CVF or CVR in the affected MCA area on single photon emission CT. And also whose age is 80 or less and uh, uh, preoperative modified ranking scale is zero to two. For this study, we excluded patients with um, Moyamoya disease. Only ICA or MCA occlusion or severe stenosis are included. And we excluded emergent surgical cases that underwent bypass surgery in the acute phase of ischemic stroke. And also we excluded the patients who have already been diagnosed with uh, dementia diseases. And uh, um, we measured the pre and six months post-operative IQ and cognitive function in all patients. Uh, we employed an IQ and cognitive assessment battery, including um, mini mental state examination, uh, extra adult intelligence scale three, trail making test, stroop test, ray auditory verbal learning test, and Benton visual retention test. We assessed changes in the assessment battery before and after surgery and uh, evaluated patient background factors related to the changes. And uh, our bypass surgery technique 
uh, was uh, mentioned by Dr. Kawashima. Uh, briefly, we routinely as double anastomosis to uh, supra and infrasilvian M4 branches. And uh, this is a result. A uh, total of 61 patients were included in this study. The mean age was 64 years old. About 60% were female patients. And 41% uh, uh, was left side surgery. And ICA was the affected vessel in about 40% of patients. The, the mean CBF value in the affected MCA area was uh, 34.5 on spec. CVR was 6.6, .6, but six months after bypass surgery, they improved to these values. And uh, this graph shows, this table shows uh, pre- and post-operative IQ and uh, cognitive functions. And IQ in phase three significantly improved after surgery and uh, some tests in labored also improved after surgery, especially in the first to uh, third trials. But there were no statistically significant difference before and after surgery in MMSE, TMT, uh, Stroop test, and uh, uh, Benton VRT. And uh, uh, regarding the patient's factors related to cognitive improvement, there were not not any statistically significant difference in age, surgical side, degrees of CBF or CVR improvement, and so on. However, uh, interestingly, uh, patients with lower preoperative IQ showed greater postoperative improvement in wave three. Um, we divided the patient into high and low pre-operative IQ groups uh, over uh, 100 or under 100. In the high IQ group, they didn't show much difference in improvement after surgery, but in uh, low IQ group, they had much positive effect in IQ improvement. This is a summary of the result. And uh, a few previous studies have focused on the effect of ECIC bypass on cognitive improvement. Some reports showed um, bypass surgery improved uh, waste R score or um, various cognitive functions in symptomatic patients with uh, hemodynamic cerebral ischemia. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, Recon trial is the only prospective uh, randomized study that determined whether ECIC bypass can improve cognitive impairment compared to the best medical treatment for patients with symptomatic ICA occlusion and uh, increased OEF. And unfortunately, the uh, result was negative. And the result is, I think, widely accepted in the US. However, uh, recon trial didn't uh, have several limitations, uh, including they did not assess um, waste three or uh, its sample size was small, and uh, most of surgical cases didn't show adequate OEF improvement. So our results may raise a question about the result of recon trial. 
And uh, the, the mechanism by that ECIC bypass improves uh, cognitive function is still unknown. Many animal studies show that uh, decreased CBF could cause cognitive impairment due to hypoxia and uh, hyperactivity in hippocampal networks. And when cognitive impairment is caused by hyperperfusion, elevating cerebral blood flow may improve patients' cognitive abilities. However, um, proposed mechanisms have yet to be proved in human clinical studies. For further studies, um, we only surgical cases were analyzed in our study. So we plan to do a um, multi-center study to collect medical treatment cases to compare the uh, surgical and uh, uh, medical cases in cognitive improvement. And some questions remained in our study, like um, why ways are improved, but TMT and stroop tests did not improve? Or uh, why uh, surgical side did not show any relationship in cognitive improvement? So we are doing a uh, sub-analysis of each test to determine what cognitive function ECIC bypass has a positive effect, such as um, improvement of memory disturbance or uh, attention disturbance or uh, executive disturbance. So this may provide some clues to find novel indications of ECIC bypass for patients with cognitive impairments. Um, that's all my presentation. By the way, um, I, I, I'll talk about this topic in the oral session at the upcoming WFNS Congress, which is held in Cape Town next month. Uh, but I'm a little nervous because it's my first time to go to South Africa, and I haven't found any friend who goes to South Africa with me. So I'm really happy if any of you doctors attend WF WFNS Congress. Please let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ishigura. I think um, your topic is uh, really important because I think a lot of times most of us neurosurgeons, we just look for the main physical disability and neuro, uh, neuro neurological symptoms such as weakness and sensory, but we always forget about the cognitive, especially the very mild cognitive. So it's very good uh, and very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to invite our discussants, uh, Professor Konsadin, would you like to uh, have anything to comment? Yes, just few just few words. That is a formidable task. I think this is one of the um, important things in the objective of, of, of our revascularizations that we have not evaluated yet. In, in any case, I think that uh, many questions are still um, difficult to answer because of the mosaic um, way in which revascularization works in the reperfusion of the cortex. And also, uh, we we have the background of atherosclerotic disease, which is also in a similar way not identity, not uniformly uh, inducing the damage. Regarding the two years outcome of the controlled study, I think that during that outcome, also the main disease of atherosclerotic damage continued. To, to, so we cannot take it as a as a final statement on the efficiency of the method. So I really would like to encourage Dr. Ishiguro to continue on this subject because we are expecting really to know if bypasses will be helpful to the patients. Thank you very much. Very much. Any, any other comments, Prof. Kato? Maybe Barasensei, please. Ishiguro-sensei, thank you very much, Dr. Ishiguro. And uh, uh, the data from Dr. Ishiguro encourage us to do the 
STMC bypass surgeon. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, you showed uh, low IQ patients improve well. How about uh, CBF or C C uh, several vascular reserve uh, study you did? You you uh, did you also analyze the uh, CBF study IQ uh, uh, low IQ and uh, high IQ? Thank you very much. That's a, a critical question. And uh, um, we analyzed the correlation between the uh, improvement of CBF or CVR and uh, cogn cognitive improvement. But um, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, uh, sh uh, should I say, um, uh, but actually uh, there are any uh, statistically significant between the uh, degree of CBF CVR improvement and the uh, uh, cognitive battery test result. So, yes, but um, one reason, uh, one possible reason I, I think is the uh, CBF CVR improvement showed a wide range at each patient so the so they had a, um, a large standard deviations so it may uh, difficult to get the uh, statistically significance I, I think thank you very much and uh, another question i have in the cost study, the complication after the surgery is large, was large. So that that was maybe a 20% complication. How percentage of your complication, I mean the ischemic complication after surgery, would you please mm -hmm. show us? Thank you very much. Uh, for uh, as long as far as my uh, experience, uh, uh, I didn't have. There, there are a very few compli ischemic complications after uh, bypass surgery. I I think uh, two or three in. Uh, I think total of. Uh, more than 100 cases. And uh, all ischemic complications are very uh, 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 not so severe. So, uh, however, um, the, we have to care uh, much rather than the ischemic complication uh, than the uh, hyperperfusion. Uh, I think that is more uh, common complications after uh, bypass surgery, uh, which uh, we don't want to happen. And uh, we uh, unfortunately experienced some case of um, ICH intracellular uh, hemorrhage after bypass surgery due to the focal hyperperfusion. Um, do, do you have any comments on, uh, on yes. this, uh, Dr. Kawashima? Uh, Dr. Kawashima. Uh, thank, oh, sorry, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, a little bit different uh, uh, between the amoeba disease and the atherosclerotic disease. Uh, it's uh, different uh, pathologies. And uh, for the ischemic complication, uh, as mentioned, Dr. Ishikuro said, uh, 
the uh, percentage is very low. I, I think uh, two, three, two or three percent. And the, in the more, more cases, uh, the complication of the uh, hyperperfusion is also three, three, around the three percent. But the, uh, in the uh, arteriosclerotic disease, very rare, but uh, uh, oh, I I remember one one around one or two percent after uh, uh, some uh, hemorrhage uh, or the uh, uh, conversion or so uh, hyperperfusion syndrome after uh, operation, but uh, uh, totally less than five percent complication in the. Uh, arteriosclerotic patient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, Professor Qureshi has a question. Or yes, you... thank you very much. Uh, it's not an area of uh, uh, much deliberation in our part of the world, but having listen to you and your thoughts about the impact on cognition. Uh, I, I just wonder whether there are similar uh, studies that show change in uh, motor skill uh, or coordination uh, following uh, such procedures. Uh, are you aware of any studies that show a positive impact on the person's ability, uh, the motor skills, as well as coordination? Uh, following such procedures? Uh, yes. Um, in our result, the uh, uh, more uh, performance IQ in V3 uh, the uh, most improved test. So um, we are now analyzing uh, what uh, cognitive impairment in, improved the best uh, by ECIC bypass. But uh, yeah, uh, we are sure that the uh, CVF improvement may uh, have a good positive effect on the um, motor function. Thank you very Thank much. You. And to uh, allay your fear about coming to Cape Town, this is an Africa's uh, ACNS series, and a lot of us will be in uh, in Cape Town, and I look forward to seeing you there. I well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, are there any more comments? So um, if there's uh, no more comments, uh, Prof. Katu, would you like to say anything? Yes, I think, uh, yes, uh, I, I, yes, I listened to his lecture uh, maybe a few, few months back. And I think uh, your uh, lecture is very, very uh, important in the uh, future uh, because so many the, uh, uh, aged uh, the aged people is increasing. Uh, I think uh, please continue your very uh, valuable uh, research. For all of us, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can meet uh, Dr. Kreshi, uh, who is come from the Kenya, and he is a representative of the World Federation. Uh, maybe I think uh, uh, he guide you a lot. I <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you. It's lovely to yes. meet you. Lovely <laughs> to meet you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, Professor Kreshi, do you want to present your topic today? I would be happy to present it at another appropriate uh, session. I've, I've been uh, really enthralled by all the vascular uh, talks, and I find that this particular one would be a little bit of a uh, sort of misfit. But, uh, you know, I'm happy to share with it, but I, I, I'd love to be able to present it at a, at a forum that is discussing uh, similar conditions, if that is something that you would uh, uh, consider. But uh, the reason, I think very generously, Dr. Liu Boon was able to fit me in because I was meant to talk yesterday 
but I was traveling. I was on a flight. So he very generously kind of readjusted my talk. But I find that it might be uh, a little misplaced. So I'm happy to defer it to another date for a, a more appropriate session. But I leave that dis decision to the organizers. So, um, shall we shall we continue, Prof. Kato, with uh, Prof. Qureshi's uh, 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 talk, or shall we uh, postpone it for another day? Um, I'll just take that question, just so you can uh, yeah. talk a few, in a few minutes, please. Come again, please. Uh, yeah, can you talk? Yes, yeah, yes, can... sure. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm yes. more than happy to. It's just that being uh, the focus yeah. on uh, aneurysm surgery and uh, endovascular and uh, bypass, uh, I know that these uh, conditions uh, impact as we as the population begins to age. So does the sacral fractures. Uh, they also increase uh, as we age. So in that context, I'm happy to discuss it. But I did find that uh, uh, despite the generosity of Dr. Lugun and uh, yourself to include me in this uh, session because I couldn't participate yesterday. I am more than happy to talk, as you, you probably uh, know, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to share my 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 talk with uh, the participants. I think you can uh, proceed, uh, uh, Prof, because I think we, maybe we need some something to uh, you know change our I mean, relax our <laughs> mind maybe too much of. <laughs> All right. If uh, that being the case, uh, I'm happy to do that. And uh, I really am honored to be allowed to present uh, uh, for this. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so we'll change uh, gears now <laughs> for another condition that really afflicts the aging populations and one of them uh, is the topic that uh, is uh, on the screen which is sacral fractures uh, and with due apologies to all the vascular colleagues who might uh, uh, not be too enthralled uh, by such uh, a neuroorthopedic spine kind of uh, discussion but rest assured that this is something that affects uh, all of our populations and we do see it in our patients and perhaps in our relatives as well. So uh, stay in there, hang on for a few more minutes and perhaps uh, as, uh, uh, as Dr. Sharon said, uh, relax your mind from the very difficult task of cognition and uh, uh, impact of cerebral blood flow impairments and the benefit from uh, ECIC bypasses, etc. So with due apologies and with due respect, I shall go ahead and present uh, just a very quick overview of the classification and management of sacral fractures. The uh, osteology of the sacrum, uh, we all, and now this is geared towards the younger uh, residents in training, uh, the talk, and I see that uh, uh, we may not all be in that category, but just a recap that this is uh, formed by the fusion of five sacral vertebrae, uh, which articulates with the fifth lumbar vertebrae proximally and the coccyx distally, the ilium laterally, and it has, uh, importantly for this particular talk, four foramina through which the sacral nerves exit. The neural structures, the L5 nerve root runs on top of the sacral ella. The S1 and four nerve roots are transmitted to the sacral foramina, which are shown uh, right there. The S1 and S2 nerve roots carry a high rate of injury and the lower sacral nerve roots, uh, S2 to five, involve the sphincteric uh, uh, tone, uh, the bulbocavernosus reflex and the perianal sensation and unilateral. It's important to recognize for those who, uh, residents who may be listening that a unilateral preservation of nerves is actually quite adequate for bowel and bladder control. 
The epidemiology of sacral fractures is it's suspected in should be suspected in up to 40% of pelvic ring injuries. It has a bimodal distribution. Uh, the In young adults, it is the high energy trauma uh, that results in uh, such fractures. Uh, while in the aging population, uh, it is the low energy falls that results in this. The associated injuries that accompany it are neurological in about a quarter of these patients, uh, and 75% of the patients will be neurologically intact. Uh, but uh, one must be aware that if you uh, examine them, 50% uh, percent, uh, of those who uh, have a neurological deficit uh, will uh, have a, uh, one must suspect a sacral fracture. The classification of sacral fractures has been a uh, up for discussion for uh, for a long time. There are many classifications that have been proposed for the purposes of this talk. We shall be concentrating on the more common one, which is the Dennis classification, but other classifications such as the Isla, the Roy Camille, the Strange Volkson, the Lebec are all classifications that have been used. One very popular uh, classification, which is uh, really being uh, given a lot of focus, is the AO classification because it's a very elaborate classification and uh, usually uh, you, you, very helpful if one is going to uh, carry out any audits or research uh, of these fractures. Uh, the uh, so the, for purposes, as I mentioned, uh, we shall discuss the classif the Dennis classification. Uh, there are basically three zones that one must be aware of in the sacrum. Zone one uh, is lateral to the foramina. Zone two is uh, fractures that involve or uh, go through the foramina itself. And zone three are fractures that are medial to uh, the uh, foramina. The zone one fractures uh, are the most commonly occurring, uh, as you as is demonstrated here. Uh, the and nerve injury is usually to the L5 nerve root and occurs rarely when this happens. Uh, that's the zone one fractures. Zone two fractures uh, are shown here. They are fractures that run through the foramina. Uh, these are by and large uh, unstable, but may be stable depending on the extent of those fractures. And there is a shear component. Uh, when If there is a shear component with these zone two fractures, it is considered unstable. They have a high risk of non-union and a poor functional outcome, as one would expect. Then there is the zone three fractures. These are medial to the to the foramina, and they obviously, for understandable reasons, have the highest neural uh, injury fallout rate. Up to 6 out of 10 patients we may have a neurological impairment that is, has impairment of bowel, bladder, and sexual uh, function. Zone 3 fractures uh, are further divided into four subtypes, uh, as outlined, and we shan't go into great detail uh, as this is not a spine uh, session. The transverse sacral fractures, uh, again, have a very high uh, nerve uh, dysfunction fallout, uh, as one would expect because of the nature of the impairment that it causes to the lower uh, nerve roots. There are those that are described as U-type fractures resulting from axial loading, falls from a height. These represent spinal pelvic dissociation with, again, a very high neurological fallout rate. The clinical presentation is uh, very important to understand, most commonly occurring in patients who've been brought in following a motor vehicle accident. And in these patients, one must uh, really be aware uh, because they can sometimes be missed. Uh, the most common is a vehicle injury in the young patient, but repetitive stress 
or insufficiency fractures uh, in the osteoporotic elderly population uh, will be uh, a source of suspicion. And commonly, they will be complaining of a peripelvic pain. Uh, examination, inspection, uh, they, one should look for evidence of soft tissue injury around the pelvis, uh, palpation, the test, testing of the pelvic ring for stability by internally and externally rotating the iliac wings, so-called the Faber and Gainsland's tests are examples of this uh, palpation. And if there is uh, subcutaneous um, uh, fluid mass, uh, then uh, this is called the morel lavelli lesion. Uh, this, again, raises suspicion. Uh, in females, it may be necessary to uh, carry out a, a vaginal examination. This is the so-called Faber test. Uh, the is performed with the patient in the supine position, one leg flexed at the knee, uh, and the, the externally rotated, and downward pressure on the uh, on the superior iliac uh, spine uh, towards the floor on the opposite side provokes pain at the site of the fracture. This is the Gainsland's test, again testing for the integrity of the pelvic ring, and it's performed as is demonstrated in this image, provoking pain at the site of the fracture uh, and uh, assesses for any instability or L4 root lesions by stretching on the femoral nerve. Uh, clinical examination, it's important to carry out a rectal examination. Light touch and pinprick sensation along the S2, S5 dermatomes, checking for a perianal wink, and uh, in males, the bulbocavernosus and cremasteric reflexes. It's important to recognize that these injuries can have a vascular fallout as well, and one must examine the distal pulses. Uh, and if they are different, then one should even consider an angiogram. And there is a, uh, the ankle brachial index, uh, which is outlined on the screen, which should be uh, carried out, and which, if impaired, suggests a vascular compromise for which an angiogram would be necessary. Radiological assessment, x-rays will reveal up to 30%, uh, which actually means that 70% may be missed by your regular x-rays. But if, you, uh, if one does focus on uh, inlet and outlet views, you're more likely to pick up these fractures. The recommended views, therefore, are to uh, carry out an inlet view. And if one does an inlet view, uh, provides the best assessment of the sacral spinal canal as, and the superior view of the uh, S1. Uh, here you see uh, that uh, trauma there. Uh, the outlet view, again, uh, provides a true AP of the sacrum and uh, uh, will uh, pull out any fractures that might be uh, present. CT scanning, however, is the diagnostic study of choice. Uh, the recommended views include coronal uh, as well as sagittal reconstructions, which then uh, point out the various fractures and the various types that uh, will be highlighted by this study. What is the role of MRI? It is highly sensitive and specific for uh, sacral stress fractures. Often it is the edema, which is most conspicuous, exhibiting uh, low signal intensity on T1 uh, or high signal on stir sequences, as is shown here. Uh, and when there is a neural uh, fallout, uh, one must uh, request for an MRI because that will uh, may, may be missed on plain x-rays or uh, will be uh, possible to see on CT, but it's important to do that in this sort of situation. So the treatment options in sacral fractures, of course, a large majority of patients can be treated non-operatively with orthosis and progressive weight bearing, depending on their pain level. 
This is often most useful in uh, fractures that have a less than one centimeter displacement with no neurological deficit, and most commonly seen in the elderly who have insufficiency fractures. The indications for surgical uh, procedures uh, are displacement of fractures of greater than a centimeter. There is soft tissue compromise, persistent pain after non-operative management, or displacement of a fracture which was being treated non-operatively, but then goes on to become more displaced. Uh, and if there is evidence of a neurological fallout, uh, surgical uh, fixation is and with decompression is often warranted. The management techniques for sacral fractures, uh, there are various percutaneous uh, techniques that have now come in. There is percutaneous sacroplasty, percutaneous screw fixation, posterior tan, uh, tension band plating, iliosacral lumbopelvic fixations, and decompression of the neural elements. Uh, just a quick word about percutaneous screw placements. These can be placed uh, as sacroiliac, transsacral, or transiliac, transsacral, useful for sagittal plane fractures. The screws are placed percutaneously under fluoroscopy uh, with, uh, with a close monitoring of your L5 nerve root. Avoid overcompression of fractures because this can cause iatrogenic nerve dysfunction. Screw placements posterior to the um, the ICD line ensures safe screw uh, placements. It is used in non-dysmorphic uh, sacrums. The, uh, the cons of this procedure is that it may result in loss of fixation or malreduction, does not allow for removal of any bone fragments, uh, which will require open surgery and should not be used uh, in osteoporotic bone fractures. Percutaneous sacroplasty is, is a, uh, a technique which has been developed, uh, which is a minimally invasive percutaneous image-guided technique, injecting polymethyl methacrylate bone cement through one or more trocar needles in the affected sacral wing. It was first documented uh, in 20, 2001 for a painful sacral metastasis, uh, followed by treatment uh, uh, of of sacral fractures in 2002. Image guidance is operator dependent uh, and usually a combination of fluoroscopy, fan beam CT and cone beam CT uh, are used and two uh, main needle approaches are the posterior and long axis. Here is the posterior approach, an AP oblique view with the L5S1 uh, this is the L5S1, and the sacroiliac joint uh, is aligned uh, with the uh, uh, detector. The needle with the uh, with the uh, the green circle is uh, is in the S1 wing, and the target S1 a needle tip at the intersection of. Uh, lines drawn from the corners of S1, and this is the percutaneous sacroplasty technique. The long axis percutaneous approach was first described in 2006 by Binari et al., uh, and it uses a single needle uh, per treatment site, has better cement distribution, and decreases the risk of anterior co cortex violation. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the pu publication that uh, really uh, shows us how uh, the single needle lateral sacroplasty is done uh, and is emerging as a useful tool for treatment of sacral fractures, either due to osteoporosis or malignancy. Uh, it uses the advantage of on-table cone beam CT combined with real-time biplane uh, imaging uh, guidance and the complete sacroplasty using just one needle is it's it is reported to be associated with significant reduction in pain uh, as measured by the visual analog scores. This is how it is done. The posterior anterior fluoroscopic image uh, is showing the 11 gauge needle inserted via the left sacral ella in this area uh, going through in a trans-iliac approach, 
of the lateral fluoroscopic image is showing the same needle inserted into S1 uh, and uh, its position within the intermedullary cavity. Uh, so this technique then uh, allows one to uh, inject the cement as the needle is withdrawn. And you really want to see this kind of image, the lateral fluoroscopic image following needle withdrawal uh, shows the methyl methacrylate uh, cement uh, confined to the sacral uh, cortex. This is uh, posterior tension band plating, uh, which is another option of treatment. Iliosacral and lumbopelvic fixation are other approaches. Uh, decompression of neural elements becomes necessary if there is neural fallout. Uh, one can do so uh, through axial traction or a direct approach by a laminectomy or foraminotomy. Complications of sacral fractures include a venous thromboembolism, iatrogenic nerve injury, and malreduction uh, occurs more commonly with uh, vertically displaced fractures. In conclusion, there are many classifications that have been proposed for sacral fractures, but none are comprehensive or universally utilized. In an effort to develop a classification that will be able to obtain global acceptance, the AO classification has been developed. Sacral fractures are common pelvic rig injuries that are underdiagnosed, and one must be aware of that, and often associated with neurological compromise. Diagnosis can be made with pelvic radiographs, but frequently require a CT scan for full characterization. Treatment may be non-operative or operative depending on fracture displacement, pelvic ring instability, and patient's activity demands. The presence of a neurological deficit is the most important factor in predicting outcome. Displacement risks a greater chance of neurological uh, fallout. Mistreated fractures may result in lower extremity deficits, urinary uh, and bowel dysfunction, and sexual dysfunction. Uh, with that, I will uh, provide acknowledgments to um, these three uh, uh, publications. These, they've really had a, have a hand in providing a lot of information uh, on sacral fractures. And with that, I will thank you very much for this opportunity to share uh, on sacral fractures in a session that was dedicated to not so orthopedic or spine uh, conditions. But I do really appreciate uh, Professor Yoko Kato and Dr. Lou Boon for having given me the opportunity to uh, present at such an August webinar that we've just heard some brilliant talks on. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Yoko Kato. We miss you. We haven't seen you in Africa now for two years. That's too much. Uh, <laughs> uh, we really need to get you back uh, yes, in Africa again. Oh, we'll visit your place uh, again. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Qureshi. It was very, very interesting. I know what you said. You don't get to hear so much on sacral fractures. Like you said, it's more of orthopedic, but I think it's important for us neurosurgeons to also be uh, you know, more aware, especially for the young neurosurgeons now. Um, any, anyone wants to comment our discussions? Prof. Uh, Constantine or Prof. Wada, would you like to comment on anything? Thank you very much, Dr. Kureshi. Uh, I'm very interested in the uh, sacral fracture. And uh, uh, in the traffic or fall, you mentioned about uh, uh, the injury point. And uh, what, what, what is the mo most popular uh, fracture is uh, 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 longitudinal fracture, you mentioned the first uh, uh, level one, two, mm -hmm. and three. Zone one. Zone one fractures are the most common in about 60% of the patients. Mm -hmm. But depending on the intensity, uh, particularly in high-speed uh, traffic injuries, 
uh, in younger patients, that's when you're no, like, more likely to see the zone two and zone three fractures. Zone ones are the most commonly seen in the osteoporotic fractures because the amount of uh, force required to cause zone two and zone three fractures is much more uh, higher. So most of our elderly patients, whether uh, particularly our osteoporotic uh, female patients uh, beyond the ages of 60 to 70, uh, if they do have a fall, uh, they are more likely to have zone one fractures. And uh, which type is necessary more, more to the surgery? Sorry, uh, come again. More, more chance to surgery. So zone yeah, one, think... zone two, zone three. It is usually the one with the, the, the translation uh, with uh, tissue that uh, really will impinge between the fracture sites. And those that are associated with a neurological fallout are more likely, and those that have undergone conservative treatment, a non-operative treatment, but are continuing to have pain, uh, those become appropriate indication for surgical intervention. So in, in our uh, institute, uh, also pediatrician take care of the sacral fracture patient, but uh, right. they don't like to operate <laughs> so may, maybe a special technique is necessary don't you think so yes i think special techniques but no now uh, not only orthopedic surgeons interventional radiologists are actually uh performing these procedures for those that i described the percutaneous methyl methacrylate uh, uh insertion uh is now being uh, done by interventional uh, neuroradiologists, uh, where uh, they they're because they're doing percutaneous techniques uh, fairly regularly, uh, they do those. It's the open operative procedures that are done by spinal uh, neurosurgeons uh, or spinal orthopedic surgeons. So, uh, I think this was basically to highlight the problem. Uh, we see these fractures come my way, for example, and then I have to look for a colleague who is particularly keen on spinal surgery and refer it on to them. So the idea behind this lecture is for awareness uh, of the problem, the uh, diagnosis and the signs, and the options of treatment uh, that are available. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Prof. Constantine, would you like to uh, have any comments? Any questions? Um, no, much. It has been really a comprehensive review of the, of the problem. Just uh, about the percutaneous sacroplasty, is it uh, having any applications in the acute conditions or it is mainly reserved for the uh, osteoporotic uh, insufficiency fractures? Mainly used in the osteoporotic ones, uh, but uh, if it's a if it's a type one and the patient uh, is mainly uh, suffering from pain, it can still be used in those sort of instances because it provides stability, just as one would expect uh, to see in uh, osteoporotic vertebral body fractures. You you inject right. the cement and the pain disappears. So. Yes, uh, if the pain is intense. Maintaining and, uh, the height, yes. Maintaining the height. And if you, uh, mm -hmm. if one uses this in even the younger patient, it can be of benefit. But usually, as you rightly state, it is for the osteoporotic elderly patient. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think um, we had a very uh, beneficial discussion today, especially between endovascular and surgical. I think a very honest um, presentations, I think, showing us uh, all the complications that can happen, um, what we are, a lot of us are not aware of sometimes. You know, like uh, Professor Wada said, patients come and they want intervention now. And sometimes, it, uh, you know, we, we can't really give them a very, very clear a view of things that can happen because endovascular is still considered still quite new in the in so-called our world. 
even though it's been there for a few years, but we are coming to realize a lot of the issues coming up. We come up with new, new modern gadgets, but then they also come up with, you know, complications sometimes or problems. So I think um, this will be ongoing and um, I hope we can get more information or more studies done to help us to understand clearer. Uh, Prof. Kato, would you like to say something before we end? Yes. So in, in next week, I think uh, maybe it's Mr. Say, the uh, uh, Endovascular Society, uh, how many membership now? More than uh, 5,000 or 6,000? Yeah, yeah. Uh, more than 5,000. Yeah. More than 5,000 membership mm, yeah. in Endovascular in Japan. And also, the Marina uh, is one of the uh, kind of the youngest uh, uh, endovascular, the, the future uh, promising <laughs> lady neurosurgeon. I think yeah. many female uh, doctors are involving in the endovascular the treatment or hybrid neurosurgeon in Japan. Marina, do you have uh, any idea? Is Are there a lot of uh, women neurosurgeons? Yes, actually, I just ran endovascular just now, but uh, two years ago, I was in the uh, the main hospital of my uh, Shoba University, so my professor is Dr. Mitsutani and so on, so I studied uh, only open surgery, so <laughs> just now I couldn't, I can't decide which way should I choose? <laughs> yeah, just now I I'm a little bit the hybrid one. So, but now so especially for women, uh, we don't have so much um, uh time to use to work. So, yeah, it's the way it's a the way of the uh. And the first care is a good way for our size. <laughs> okay, that time consuming. I think it's uh, my best wishes to you, the future carrier. <laughs> I think uh, today, uh, so many uh, uh, ex uh, expert uh, and the basket, the surgeon, uh, tell us uh, the latest uh, the knowledge, and they will be presenting in next week. I think. Uh, my best wishes to your presentation in the future uh, successful career and uh, the, the last uh, but not least uh, i think uh, kawashima sensei and ishiro sensei uh, ishiro sensei is a student of dr kawashima the, the their hospital is very famous for bypass and uh, Kawash uh, ishiro sensei is uh, the young uh, i think uh, uh, teacher for uh, awareness in, in in the future i think my best wishes and also Dr. Kreshi, thank you very much for your the continuous support uh, for uh, Asian and uh, thank you. Its, uh, educational thank you. activity. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank so, you I very think, much. Uh, maybe I think uh, all of us will visit uh, Kenya uh, once again. We certainly hope so. Yes, yes. we certainly hope so. so uh, today's uh, the team is endovascular and uh, bypass and uh, all uh, hybrid team. Especially yes, uh, that would be wonderful. Amira, Amira Shah can add of the glioma, I think. <laughs> okay, yes. thank you so much. <laughs> thank so, you. Uh, be healthy and uh, good uh, Congress in uh, Cape Town. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. All the best. Thank you again. Thank you, thanks so much. Bye. Good night. Bye, everyone.